David Gans has a long history making music, writing about music, and broadcasting music. He recently added a new entry to his musical resume, hosting Psychedelia and Groove, Music and Culture of the Grateful Dead, a continuing studies course at Stanford University. But what I proposed was uh, a, a class that was going to be very, very loosely structured. And I said, here are, the, here, uh, here are six things that we will address in these six sessions, but they won't be rigidly divided into these things because everybody that I invite in to talk about this with me will have expertise in all these areas. I said, we talk about the history, we'll talk about songwriting, we'll talk about improvisation, We'll talk about the culture, the deadhead culture, and, and how the great people that impacted the music and the world around them. And we'll talk about the great people that's amazing uh, uh, way of uh, interpreting people's music. That's one of the most important things they did was take music from outside the great dead and make it their own. Hey everybody, welcome to the latest episode of the Utopia News Network podcast featuring John Lepkowski, yours truly, and Scoop Sweeney, a partner in crime, who's way out there in the woods. <laughs> and our guest today is David Gantz. David is a musician, and he's a songwriter, and a music journalist. Uh, and he's a great guitarist. Uh, and a cat lover. You can find him on YouTube. Huh? <laughs> and a cat lover. And a cat lover, as you can see. <laughs> so, David, hello. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing fine, man. I'm just in the afterglow of this uh, wonderful experience I just had. I lucked into an opportunity to teach a class about the Grateful Dead for Stanford Continuing Studies. And it just concluded its final session Monday night. And I'm, it's just been a, an amazing experience, really, really fun. And I'm getting huge amounts of feedback from the students. And Stanford has invited me to teach it again in the fall. So it's kind of exciting. It's a whole new career path. Fantastic. For me. Is it a face-to-face -face course or is it uh, no, online? No, it's online. I can do it from home, like so much of my work. Dang, if I'd known that, I would have signed up. <laughs> well, we'll do it in the fall. I'll get the next one. Yeah. So this so is up have, to uh, people that aren't uh, Stanford students then. Yeah, it's Stanford Continuing Studies. It's regular, plain old, you know, adult education kind of stuff. And and they expected 40 or 50 people, and we had more than 300. Great. And oh because Lord. it was online, it was coast to coast. So we had a lot of people on the East Coast, some of whom had to watch it the next day on the on the recording because it was so late and stuff. But it was just a... Thoroughly wonderful experience, and I organized it so that I didn't have to work too hard on it. I didn't have to, like, develop a structured curriculum and do lectures and stuff. I said, this is going to be uh, like more like a seminar than a lecture series, you know, following the form of the Grateful Dead being conversational and improvisational. So I invited a bunch of interesting fellow experts to join me, and we basically schmoozed through the two-hour sessions each week. That sounds fantastic. Who were some of the experts? Uh, Steve Silberman, a great, great friend of mine who is a poet and an yeah, author Steve. and wrote uh, a, a terrific book years ago called uh, Skeleton Key, A Dictionary for Deadheads. And it's just been one of my close friends for years in all sorts of spiritual and musical and otherwise travels. Uh, Jesse Jarnow, who's a younger uh, historian and is the co-host and producer of the amazing good old Grateful Dead cast, uh, the really, really deep uh, dive into Grateful Dead history that's uh, run by Grateful Dead, you know, Deadnet. And I had uh, Gary Lambert, my partner on uh, Tales from the Golden Road. He's a geezer of approximately my age with long experience, both listening to, documenting, and also playing Grateful Dead music. We began with Peter Richardson, a historian of my acquaintance who published a fabulous history of the Grateful Dead called No Simple Highway. And for the last session, I had Blair Jackson and Regan McMahon, who are dear friends of mine, colleagues for nearly 50 years, and, and neighbors to boot, who have been Grateful Dead fans all these years and published an amazing fanzine for many years called The Golden Road. And Blair wrote one of the 
coolest biographies of Jerry Garcia called Garcia and American Life. So everybody who joined me for these things had just, you know, brilliant credentials. And we just had a really nice uh, unstructured time interacting with the uh, with the class. And that, as again, the feedback I've been getting since it ended has just been really, really lovely and warm and delightful. But before we get into it any further, uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your history with the Grateful Dead? Because I know that you've been like deeply involved in that particular cultural milieu for years and years. What, 50 years? Uh, well, I became a fan of the Grateful Dead more than 50 years ago on March 5th of 1972. I yesterday celebrated the 52nd anniversary of my first Dead show. I've been a musician since I was 15. I've been writing my own songs and stuff since I was 15 in, in uh, out here in California. I got turned on to the dead when I was 19 or 18. And it just opened up my life in a lot of different directions. It opened up my musicality tremendously and introduced me to lots of different kinds of music and different ways of making music. And so starting in that time, uh, I started playing Grateful Dead-ish music with friends over the years. And then I wandered into journalism in the mid-70s uh, because I was always a writer. I was writing songs and I had written stories for myself and stuff. And I started doing music journalism out here in the Bay Area in the 70s as a way to get free concert tickets and records and stuff. I wound up getting a gigantic education in all of those things because I had access to all these people. I interviewed Leo Fender and Les Paul, and I interviewed record producers and, you know, rock stars and and I and and all sorts of stuff for a good 10 years as a general purpose music journalist. And I covered the Grateful Dead as often as I could. And I got to interview them a bunch of times for various magazines. And I published my first book about the Grateful Dead in 1985, playing in the band, an oral and visual portrait of the Grateful Dead, which I did in collaboration with the photographer, Peter Simon. That led to my appearing on a local radio show here in the Bay Area called the K-Fog Deadhead Hour. And I had an affinity for that. I had a huge collection of tapes and some knowledge of how to present them on the air and curate them on the air. And eventually the, the station asked me to take over responsibility for the show, which I happily did because it was a huge amount of fun. And then other radio stations started calling and asking if they could carry the show. So without my ever forming a plan or intention to do so, I became the host and, and a producer of a nationally syndicated radio show, The Grateful Dead Hour, which still exists to this day. And in fact, as I'm sitting here talking to you, Scoop and John, I'm rendering next week's show on my other computer so that I can upload it to my network later today. So that's been a, a, a basically I became like a full time Grateful Dead expert by accident 30 plus years ago. And for the last 16 years, I've been co-hosting a talk show on Sirius XM's Grateful Dead channel as well with my partner, Gary Lambert. And that's been great fun too. That's basically open the phones and BS about the dead for two hours a week. And uh, so I, I've, and along the way, I, I co-produced several box sets of Grateful Dead and Jerry Garcia material. I've written liner notes for a bunch of releases. So yeah, I've been sort of a professional curator of Grateful Dead music for upwards of 30 years while still pursuing my own musical interests. Um, but you guys understand it's really hard to make a living as a musician. So I've happily made my living doing these other dead related things, why, and which helps me to fund my own musical adventures. Yeah, I was paging through the uh, Grateful Dead uh, section on uh, Wikipedia, and they have an interesting uh, listing on the sidebar of spinoff bands and yeah. there's a lot and these are just the ones that people would possibly know about and i'm sure those spinoffs had spinoffs and there's tons of I've, I've run across grateful dead tribute bands all over the country when i was out on tour with my own band i would <laughs> encounter opening acts he said you mind if we play the grateful dead it's like whatever <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, it's well, people like me 
became musicians or or who were musicians fell in love with this music and started playing this music ourselves it's it's a it's it's not like learning a bunch of songs and playing them together it's a musical language that we speak with each other that's the the magic of grateful dead music is that it's a unique form of conversational improvisation and it involves listening to each other and building musical structures spontaneously uh, and, and it's just been, it, it's very compelling music. If you like playing it, you'll find people to play with it. I have, I have, I started playing with some friends 50 years ago when I moved to Berkeley and some of whom I still play with occasionally when we, when we can find time to get together, but there are tribute bands all across the country. There's a website called grateful dead tribute bands.com that musicians can register with and list their gigs there. And so if you're traveling and you get to Cleveland on a Tuesday you can you can type in the zip code where you are or something like that, and it'll tell you, you know, the Jim Miller band is playing over at the Winchester tonight, that kind of thing. And there are hundreds. I, I Somebody the other day just told me uh, how many, I, I can't remember the exact number, but there are like 700 or something Grateful Dead tribute bands registered on that site that list their gigs. It's amazing music. It's wonderful music. We love, if you like hearing it, you know, you'll go to a local club and dance to your local band doing it um, in between opportunities to see the actual guys. Yeah, see, there you go. I know that guy, Scott Guberman. I know some of the Dead Beats New York. That's a great, great, great band. Friends of mine up in Woodstock. So many. Sorry, I... Uh... I got kind of fascinated by that website. <laughs> Pay attention, John. So how how did you get connected with Stanford? Uh, that was also a was very happy accident. My colleague and friend, Joel Selvin, who was the um, pop music critic for the San Francisco Chronicle for 40 years or so, um, suggested me to them. I don't know whether they invited him to do it or they just asked him for his advice, but Joel suggested that I might be a good guy to teach that class for continuing education. And I uh, appreciated the referral and I called them and they looked at my CV and they listened to my suggestion of how I'd want to do it. They accepted it and they put it up. And I, again, to my great surprise, they expected 40 or 50 people and we got more than 300. So it was Joel who introduced me to them and the rest just apparently took care of itself. And you said you didn't have like a too much of a set curriculum or a structure. Did you do like what was your plan going into it? Well, I had to write a syllabus, which laid out the basic goals of the class, but they were kind enough to let me, I mean, I looked at a few other syllabi. I have friends who are college professors, and I looked at their syllabi, and they're all just very detailed and thorough and describes, you know, classes with specific trajectories and stuff. And I just thought, first of all, I don't have the, the skills. I'm not a trained teacher by any stretch. And I, you know, I but I'm a journalist, and I'm a, a, I'd been bullshitting on the radio for decades, you know, so I, I knew that I had a grasp of the material. But what I proposed was a, a, a class that was going to be very, very loosely structured. And I said, here are the here, uh, here are six things that we will address in these six sessions, but they won't be rigidly divided into these things because everybody that I invite in to talk about this with me will have expertise in all these areas. I said, we talk about the history, we'll talk about songwriting, we'll talk about improvisation, we'll talk about the culture, the deadhead culture and, and how the grateful that impacted the music and the world around them. And we'll talk about the Grateful Dead's amazing uh, uh, way of uh, interpreting people's music. That's one of the most important things they did was take music from outside the Grateful Dead and make it their own. So I, I basically said, here are six loose categories for what's going to happen, but we are going to jump over these walls and every class will touch on all of these things. 
because, for example, Steve Silverman wrote a book about the Grateful Dead culture, but he also has written a book about autism, and he knows a lot about psychology, and he knows a lot about poetry, and he knows a lot about, he interviewed Robert Hunter, and he went to Grateful Dead shows for 30 plus years, and he's also a big fish fan. So we got Steve's perspective on all of those areas. We talked about songwriting. We talked about his friendship with David Crosby and how David Crosby related to the dead, et cetera. And Jesse, another one, just a really, really deep historian who has tremendous amounts of information about all of this, but also has his own experiences as a fan and as a musician and as a DJ on WFMU. So again, everybody talked about everything. And so every session was really, really loose. And we'd stop and take questions from the class as well. And we also listened to music. I would prepare like ten or to eight to 10 minute sections of music. And we would play those and discuss them with each of the the participants. I asked each of my guests to choose some pieces of music that they wanted to comment on. So every class had a few music breaks in it and a lot of discussion. And we also, because there was so much demand from the students, I had two separate listening sessions where Gary Lambert and I got on the Zoom with anybody who wanted to come. And we would play pieces of music that we had produced ahead of time and, and explain what was going on. And we also took suggestions from members of the class. Here's a, here's a, here's a stretch of music I enjoyed. Can you tell us what's going on here? So again, be, I'm not a musicologist. I, 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 my friend Graham Boone is a genuine musicologist at Ohio State, and I've seen him give these incredible detailed musicological analyses of Dark Star and stuff. I'm not skilled and qualified to do that, but I've been playing Dark Star in my own bands for 50 years, and I can describe for the class much more adeptly than any other teacher I've ever seen what it's like to play this music. And so I could talk about this music from the perspective of an improviser and a performer in a way that uh, other teachers couldn't. So I just brought a unique collection of experiences and understandings to my role and put to work my 40 years of BSing about it in public. So it it, it just kind of turned out to be a really, really nice opportunity for me to put together everything that I've learned over these years and impart it in an extremely audience-friendly way, I guess, according to the feedback I've been getting. I have received, over the course of this thing, exactly one email complaining about the class, and it was from a guy who clearly had not read the syllabus. The people at Stanford have just been incredibly warm and receptive and told me how much they enjoyed working with our class, you know, the members of the class. So just everything about it has been thoroughly pleasant and extremely well-received. So Dark Star is a favorite of mine. Could you kind of give us an idea of like say a few things about Dark Star to kind of give us a sense of that that what those Happily. discussions were like? Happily. Do you know, do you ever watch Stephen Colbert? You know the Colbert questionnaire? Yeah, yeah. One of the 15 questions in the Colbert questionnaire is if you could only listen to one song for the rest of your life, what song would it be? I my unhesitating answer would be Dark Star as long as I can listen to every version of Dark Star. And the thing about Dark Star is it, it's a it's a perfect example of the Grateful Dead because the song itself was recorded in the studio once and it's two and a half minutes of music. But every live Dark Star was at least three, four, five, or maybe ten times that length because it was an improvisational vehicle. They would begin with a musical, a loose musical dialogue in the mode of that song. And then they would just sort of wander around until they got to the song. And then they would sing part of the song, the verse and the chorus. Then they would go off and jam again. For some unspecified, excuse me, for some unspecified length of time. And then they would either wander into another song or they would come back and play the second verse and finish the song. And they did it different ways every single time. And over the years, the music that happened in those spaces changed because the personnel changed, the instrumentation changed, the keyboardist that they had at a given time had different styles and different instruments that they were bringing to it. And the drugs they were taking changed over the years, that also mattered. And all of these other factors 
And so, and I once listened to like several hundred dark stars in a row for a, a book project that didn't happen. So uh, it, it's a, it's a, in, in sort of a universe really. And Tom Constantin, who played in the Grateful Dead for a few years, once said it's dark star is more like a place than a piece of music. And you kind of enter it and hang out there for a while and then leave it, but it's still going on. So it's kind of fun to think about Dark Star being something that's happening at all times and all of us take turns tapping into it, kind of. But you can listen to the Dark Star on Live Dead, which was recorded on February 27th of 1969. You can listen to the Dark Star that was recorded on July 12th of 1990 with a, a different keyboardist and uh, a, a, in an, a much larger venue in front of a, a much larger audience. And you can hear two similar, but very, very different readings of the song. Then you can listen to the Dark Star that was recorded uh, on October 16th, 1989 in Miami that has this incredible deep noise jam in the middle of it where all the guys in the band are playing MIDI controlled instruments that don't sound like their own instruments. Um, Jerry could play a flute through his guitar or a trumpet or a bassoon and and Bob Weir could play percussion instruments with his guitar and stuff like that so every version of Dark Star was different and you can listen to each one and hear something new in it each time so it, to me that's the sort of microcosm of the Grateful Dead and that's why I would tell Colbert Dark Star but let me have all of them <laughs> you know the uh, whole improvisational method that they used uh, definitely was evident anytime you went to a live show. I went to many shows at uh, Winterland. I took friends along and I would warn them, do you have anything that you have to be doing later tonight? Because <laughs> this may take a while. And they'd say, oh, no, it's okay. But then after, you know, the fourth or fifth hour, <laughs> they'd go, can we go now? <laughs> This is great, John. You've got a list of dark stars, not just by the Grateful Dead, but by all these other people, too. Uh, I'm not sure Beck's dark star is our dark star, but you just never know. <laughs> but look at all those. A lot of those are by the Grateful Dead, but there's all these other people that play Grateful Dead. In fact, there's a, a band called Dark Star Orchestra that has been touring and, and playing large venues, being a Grateful Dead tribute band that plays a very, very faithful recreations of Grateful Dead shows, not note for note, but vibe for vibe. If they're playing a show from 1974, they'll use the same instrumental configuration uh, and, and play in the same spirit of that era. And if they're playing one from a later year, they'll have two drummers and other stuff like that. So uh, Dark Star- I thought I had showed you most of them, but, but I keep scrolling and it just doesn't stop. There's just more and more and more, and more of these. But it's many amazing. of those are Grateful Dead performances from, you know, there have been hundreds of concerts have been released. They've had a, they've had the Dick's Picks concert series. Now there's the Dave's Picks concert series that just set a record for, for their 50th release in, in their series of live concert recordings. And there was the Road Trip series in between, plus the official live album. So the Grateful Dead themselves have probably released, you know, close to 50 live versions of Dark Star in their own canon, plus all of these other ones by all these other people. One of the things I, I loved about uh, the Dead was they didn't uh, discourage recording of their shows. There were so many people I ran across that, I've got a Dead tape, and they've written everywhere. And uh, I found that unique because very few bands would allow that. Well, they recognized early on that that it was marketing for them. It was really, really good marketing. They they actually started broadcasting their shows. Uh, Sam Cutler, who was the tour manager for the Grateful Dead in the early 70s, who they inherited from the Rolling Stones, by the way, he crossed over at Altamont. He was the Stones tour manager and got left holding the bag after Altamont in December of 69, went to ground in the Grateful Dead's world and became their tour manager for several years. It was it was Sam and Rock Scully who decided it was a good idea to broadcast shows on local radio. So the whole fall 71 tour, they broadcast like from dozens of college campuses around. And, and that began the process of 
marketing themselves to a, a smart, educated demographic who latched onto it, guys like me, fell in love with it, started collecting these tapes. And we started, we realized very early on that each one was different and we wanted to hear, they never played the same set list twice. They never played the song the same way twice. So we quickly realized that each performance was worth hearing on, on its own merits and as part of a continuum. And they, uh, th th at times the Grateful Dead took issue with it. There's a wonderful uh, moment in the New Year's Eve 1970 show where a couple of the band members uh, call out a guy with a pair of microphones in the audience, spotlight on the bootleggers. And they wanted to get rid of that guy because at that time, bootleg vinyl was starting to happen. People were recording shows and then pressing vinyl and the record companies got really upset about that because they were cutting into, you know, I have a few of those. I got a Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young bootleg years and years ago and i have a couple of grateful dead bootlegs but the the grateful dead wisely figured out that bootleg albums weren't really causing them to lose much because they weren't relying on record sales to begin with they were relying on their live performances to begin with so they quickly figured out that these recordings were calling cards for them they were viral marketing before that term existed and I remember the first time I ever heard a Grateful Dead a concert tape. I didn't know that culture existed. We went to the show on March 23rd of 74, that where they debuted the Wall of Sound System at the Cow Palace. Wonderful show, amazing technology. And a couple of weeks later, I was over at my bandmate Al's house and he had a reel-to-reel -reel of the show. And we sat and listened in his living room to the whole show again. It blew my mind. I went, oh my God, I've got to hear more of this. So I started connecting with other people. And it turns out there was this entire network of freaks that were recording shows and sharing the tapes. And, and this whole culture evolved about people getting together to copy tapes. And that is, by the way, is covered occasionally in the good old Grateful Dead cast, this amazingly deep uh, podcast that I was mentioning earlier in the 73 season last year, there was a little sidebar in one of the shows from a guy who talked about the amazingly deep friendships that formed over the years in this culture. He said, because in those days, if you wanted to copy the tape, you had to bring your deck over to that guy's house and sit and listen to it with him while you made your copy. He said, and so many of us spent so much time together in those rooms copying those tapes that we form deep friendships that abide to this day. And it was such a lovely thing for him to say. And, and I, and I reflect on my own friendships with all those people. A fellow named Ed Perlstein is a great photographer was very generous with me in the early days. We met at BAM magazine when I was a writer there and he was a contributing photographer and he invited me over and let me copy a bunch of his tapes so well, that's one of the things that helped me get launched in the radio business because I had a bunch of great sounding tapes from Ed. And 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 Ed, Ed was like that. Um, the late Jerry Moore was like that. A couple of brothers, the O.D. brothers, O-A-D-E, uh, were huge in that world. They developed uh, portable recording technology to make it easier to make good quality tapes. And they started using digital audio recording as soon as it became available in the early 80s. And they distributed vast quantities of those shows to people specifically for the purpose of sharing with the world their own experiences at the concerts. Their recordings were not just to record the music, but to record the entire ambience around them. And, and, and that kind of stuff is why there are so many deadheads today. The Grateful Dead culture is bigger and more popular now than it was when Jerry Garcia died 38 years ago. You mentioned the wall of sound, which is one of my favorite <laughs> things that they did. And, and the fact that the band contributed to the musical community, especially in the Bay Area, um, band I was with needed a sound system and we hired a sound guy who had part of the old wall of sound that had been farmed out to a lot of sound people and bands uh, throughout the Bay Area. I was constantly running across those 
big bins and the big horns, and you knew exactly where they were from. Some of them even had it still <laughs> painted on the on the back of the of the cabinets. Wow. And that was just the sort of culture they created is they weren't going to be stingy with what they did. They <laughs> they shared with the you know the whole community. Yes, and they were obsessed with good quality sound. Remember, their first sound man was Owsley Stanley, who came to great fame by making the best fucking LSD ever outside of Sandoz, I guess. I had the good fortune of trying some of his acid a few times. But Owsley, brought, he brought his own, he had his voice of the theater speakers in his house in Berkeley, and he brought them over to the Fillmore, thereby creating basically the first rock and roll sound system. And he invested his money in PA systems for them and also started a company called Alembic with several other technologists, including the late, great Rick Turner, to develop instruments, to improve the electronics of all the instruments, to learn about acoustics and to, to interface PA systems to concert venues. And they developed speaker systems and, and they fostered the development of speaker systems. John Curl, who is a legend in this uh, uh, home audio, you know, the uh, consumer audio sound system business, John Meyer, who who uh, was not directly with them, but was associated with the Grateful Dead and, and used the Grateful Dead concerts as test beds for his speaker systems. Meyer Sound is now a world-class speaker system manufacturer based in uh, here in Berkeley, that sells sound systems not only to like concert venues and stuff around the world, but also has sound systems in places like restaurants where they can control the noise levels in restaurants with their technology. And, that's, and that is amazing technology that exists now. And the Grateful Dead contributed to the development of it by allowing them to experiment on us, their audience. <clears throat> and, and, and otherwise too, I mean, the, the wall of sound toured throughout 1974. It was officially debuted in March of 74 after nearly finished versions of it had been used for several months. That ended in October of 1974. The, the um, wall of sound system uh, required vast or tons, literally tons of hardware. And there, there were two stage systems that toured. There, there was the, there, the, the, a uh, truck would go off to the next city and start building the stage and scaffolding for the wall of sound while they were playing this gig. And then they would move the speakers and amps and everything to the next gig. And then the that stage would leapfrog to the next venue. It was incredibly expensive. And in 1974, uh, geezers like the three of us will remember that was the first energy crisis when the cost of gasoline started to go up. So it became impractical to tour with that kind of system. And the dead wound up taking 20 months off from touring altogether, starting in October 74. So that's when the wall of sound got parted out and all those speaker cabinets got sold off and stuff. But the technology, what we learned from Owsley Stanley's original vision of coherent single point source sound has been applied and put to use everywhere in, on the planet since then. So yeah, the Grateful Dead contributed greatly to the to the benefit of all of us for good concert sound and good sound in all venues. I imagine the uh, expense involved with carting that around the country and having to uh, have you know stage calls of stagehands to set it up. I mean, that looked like just the size of it would take a lot of manpower it did indeed <clears throat> and usually i remember went to a lot of shows usually there'd be somebody up on the scaffolding swapping out one speaker up there i mean there were literally like hundreds of speakers tiny ones and big ones from like a few 18 inch bass speakers down to like you know three inch uh, uh tweeters and stuff in various clusters so there I, I would see somebody up there swapping out a speaker at any given moment in a show so yeah it was a high maintenance very costly in a lot of ways but jesus christ it sounded good sounds amazing i i wonder so that is one way that the grateful dead influenced music uh and influenced the presentation of music particularly but how about like the culture of music and and music as it's played i know 
I, I think of the Grateful Dead as being kind of a jazz band, really, because they did so much improvisation. And they even, you know, they famously played with Ornette Coleman, who was a Texas guy. And yeah. um, I wonder if there is there a recording in that concert? There is, but Ornette never gave me permission to broadcast that one. I the the recording was made and I begged for permission. And my my colleague Gary Lambert was a good friend of Ornette's and and had, you know, and made the plea, but they were unwilling to let me broadcast that. So the tape exists, but has never been released to the public for whatever reason. It was a lovely show. And what I enjoyed most about that was that Ornette basically kicked their butts and kept them out at the edge of the universe when they kept trying to rein it the jam they were doing the other one and they just kept going far he just kept pushing them farther out when you'd hear them kind of trying to okay let's come back to the head of the song and finish here and ornette just kept going nope let's keep going it was really really fun to watch him pushing them out across the universe they also had very famously branford marsalis in in march oh, of yeah. 1990 branford came and sat in with them, ha having not even really heard Grateful Dead music. And he stepped up on stage with them and played so well with them improvisationally in his first encounter with them that one song from that was re released very soon thereafter, and the entire concert was later released. And Branford began a, a, an occasional relationship with them and opened shows for them later and stuff. But they appreciated jazz players and embraced jazz very much, but their repertoire was much more of folk rock and country and Americana, which is one of the things that makes it unique. They, I, I've often referred to it as jazz syntax with a folk uh, vocabulary. Yeah, I mean, they kind of opened it up for for bands to like not tie themselves too much to one particular genre or one particular way of playing. It was well, sort of like whatever suited the time and the and the 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 vibe of the time. Well, they were open minded as individuals, and they were determined to stay interested and to keep their thing growing at all times. And if you look at the progression of their songwriting, I mean, they went on a serious songwriting binge. Bob Weir, Jerry Garcia, and to a lesser extent, Phil Lesh wrote a ton of songs between like sixty nine and seventy four. And, and built this huge repertoire of songs that were all great, or most of them were great, and remained in their book. So they kept expanding their repertoire, and they would bring in songs from other places that opened up their rhythmic and harmonic universes. So they kept it fresh, and they conditioned their audience to expect novelty. I was a, a mainstream music journalist from 76 to 86, and I covered a lot of shows of you know other music being a deadhead did not cause me to lose my objectivity about the rest of the music world but i i remember several large concerts where audiences would just eat the opening acts alive they just wanted to hear the headliner and they were kind of cruel to opening acts and they also there was also that thing of expecting the headliners to play their hits and they want to hear you know you're going to do this thing you're going to expect that. In fact, once I interviewed Don Felder of the Eagles, because I had seen the Eagles play the exact same show two days in a row in Oakland, the exact same show, literally note for note. And they did a great job of it, but it was the exact same show two days in a row. And I asked him some when, later when his solo album came out, I, I commented on that. And I said, you know, you guys do an amazing job of that. But and he said, well, if you pay $18 to hear the Eagles and you don't hear your favorite guitar lick on Hotel California, you're going to be bummed. And I okay, okay, that's a valid approach. But it's the inverse of how the deadhead world was. You know, we didn't go there expecting that. <clears throat> we went there expecting novelty. And in in if the Eagles had done a show where they played seven new songs we had never heard before, their audience would have been nonplussed and not necessarily in a happy way, right? But when the Grateful Dead brought six new songs in, their audience was thrilled. I I suppose if the Grateful Dead showed up and started playing something that was new wave or punk or something like that, that I mean I think about Bob Dylan when he started playing rock and roll. 
and how controversial that was and how pissed off his audiences were. So I guess probably a way they could stretch it that that the audience might not have liked. Well, the, Gary told me once that in 69, when the Grateful Dead started doing acoustic sets and playing Merle Haggard songs and stuff, he remembered seeing a few people walking out of the film where he's going, oh, shit, they're turning into a cowboy band, you know. But mostly people like us appreciated the new things and and ex expanded our musical ambits uh, to correspond with the expansions in theirs. And it was, they again, they trained us to expect novelty and to appreciate novelty and to thank them for it. And I... I that and another friend of mine, when I when Jerry died, I did an expanded edition of playing in the band, and I asked a few questions of a whole lot of people, and one of them was, "How did the Grateful Dead change you?" And a friend of mine said, "Well, I grew up, you know, I'd have my favorite movie, and I'd see my favorite movie over and over again." He said, "But once I got into the Grateful Dead, I stopped being interested in seeing things more than once. They taught me to appreciate the freshness and novelty, and to embrace." adventure rather than familiarity so i think that's really one of the hallmarks of this thing is that they were forcefully eclectic and built an audience that loved that about them and i think that we take out into our lives i mean i i really feel that being an improvisational musician is a state of mind that serves me well in every other circumstance in my life that being an improvisational musician mean, means that you're open, you're listening to what's going on around you. You're not just discoursing from your own point of view, but you're interacting with the people around you and you're responding to what's being said. And I think that has served me well as an interviewer, as a journalist, as, you know, because you learn to listen as well as to talk. And so it's, it's, a, it's a lifestyle of of uh, interactiveness that's different from all of so many of the other bands, like the band, great, great, great band, but they played the perfected version of all their songs in every show. And it wasn't really about stretching things out and improvising other than Garth Hudson's solo in each show, you know what I mean? So we would, we wanted that and we take that into the rest of our lives. And also another thing, a sociologist friend of mine said that deadheads tend to collect experiences rather than artifacts. And, uh, you know, taking into account, we collect all those tapes and stuff. Those are artifacts of experience. And I think that collecting tapes is collecting a variety of experiences. But the main thing is to go do things in real time rather than to put things on your shelf. Some of the artifacts they created were not so much musical, but graphic. The uh, every time a, an album came out, I was always thrilled to see what the cover would look like. And it was usually something by Mouse or one of the fellow travelers of that group. And they gave, you know, the, the world a lot of, you know, Skull and Roses, you know, is the, you know, the iconic image and is stuck with the Grateful Dead forever. But there were yeah. so many other ones just, you know, you look at any album and it was a work of art. And their fans also made art. And one of one of my favorite things about this culture was the the sort of um, uh, intellectual property hybrids that people would make. Um, you, you, there's there's you, I I cherished a buddy of mine had a shirt I could never find one for myself. It's just a regular image of Charlie Brown from a Peanuts frame, but somebody had drawn a Grateful Dead logo on the on his shirt, right? But then they would take stuff. There was back in the '90s, Federal Express. Their their uh, slogan on their ads was, "When it absolutely positively has to be there overnight." So at one time it, in Denver, I ran into a guy with a T-shirt that said "Grateful Express" in the typography of the Federal Express logo, and on the back it said, "When you absolutely positively have to be there every night." And there was a, a, the Mountain Dew logo from the soda can, right? They they changed that to Morning Dew, one of the great Grateful Dead cover songs. Things like that. The creativity of the audience in bringing outside cultural stuff into their Grateful Dead experience was a huge amount of fun. Yeah, that makes me think of this. Um, give me a second here. There you go. Oh, 
this yeah. is uh lp giabi is a great like dj who uh has remixed the garcia album she you know, has it's pretty good it, that's very controversial yeah. i've heard some people that don't like it much and we played a little oh, bit i'm of it. sure yeah, yeah. But I really enjoy it I, because I've, I've been also a digital audio artist for years. I've since I started doing radio, I've I've made little montages as intros for my weekly radio show for years, taking little tiny words and, and notes from various songs and stringing them together to do different things. What she does is vastly more sophisticated than that. She takes those stems from the Jerry songs and puts them on top of other kinds of grooves and beds and stuff. It's really, really interesting and really creative. It's not for everybody, but I, I do love what she does. I mean, I'd say I don't I didn't really like it better than the original album, but I liked it, you know, and, and, and I thought that it was uh, it was a great tribute, really, you know, and it's it was kind of great to learn that she's a deadhead. We were aware of her already and we thought she was pretty good, but I had no idea that she was into the Grateful Dead to the extent that she uh, apparently is. Yeah, but that's just an example of something else, you know. That's kind of like what you're talking about. There's all these emanations from the dead's world. Uh, what the thing I wanted to ask you is kind of what what was what happened with the dead when Jerry died? Well, ev everything stopped for about a minute and a half. But Bob Weir had been working regularly with a band called Rat Dog. And he was actually on tour the day Jerry died and they played their show that night. So Bob didn't really stop doing what he was doing. Mickey Hart was already doing Mickey Hart stuff. I mean, he had his own, he's he's made dozens of records, world music and, and a lot of original music. And he was doing, I don't remember what he was doing exactly that moment, but he didn't stop doing what he was doing. Bill Kreutzmann was still retired for a while and Phil Lesh stopped playing for a while. And Vince Welnick uh, kept playing. He he had launched a project called Missing Man Formation. So he kept playing. Um, but the organization just kind of got the wind knocked out of it for a little while. But the culture didn't really stop because none of us stopped loving Grateful Dead music just because we just because Jerry wasn't there to make new music. And over time, people went back to work. Phil Lesh actually kind of he he had not played at all for about two years and he actually came back he played once or twice with bruce hornsby as a sit-in guest but he came and played with my band in in um berkeley in september of 97 and i had started doing these things called the broken angels where i put together different bands of people playing grateful dead music every week and he came and sat in with us at one of those shows and saw how this worked. And he realized, oh, my God, there's all these people that play this music. It's like Dixieland or Bluegrass. There's a, a repertoire that's available to everybody. And if you speak the language, you can play this music and jam together. And Phil played four shows with us uh, over the next couple of months and then started doing his own thing. So starting in 98, he was back on the road. And he's he's right now celebrating his 84th birthday with a run at the Capitol Theater in New York. So Phil went went back to work then, uh, 25 years ago, and has been working ever since. Bob Weir never stopped working. He is currently working with a band called Bobby Weir and Wolf Bros with the great Don Was on bass. Don is an amazing musician and also the president of Blue Note Records, an incredible guy. And uh, Jay Lane on drums and Jeff Comenti, who's been Bobby's keyboard player for 30 years on keys. And they've been playing with a, a five piece wind and, and string section called the Wolf Pack. And they have played with symphony orchestras. Last fall on my birthday, I went to see them at, at the Frost Amphitheater in Stanford. Bobby Weir and Wolf Bros with the Stanford Symphony Orchestra. It was an amazing thing. Mickey Hart is still doing stuff. Kreutzmann isn't playing as much right now, but he plays occasionally. And then, of course, in 2015, they celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Grateful Dead by doing a show called Fare Thee Well that wound up being five concerts, two in Santa Clara and three in Chicago, that were billed as the last time the original four would play together. Phil Lesh, Bob Weir, Bill Kreutzmann, and Mickey Hart. So they played those five shows together and then went their separate ways. But at that same time, Bobby and Mickey and Bill announced a new band 
with John Mayer to be called Dead and Company. And John Mayer was already a world-class musician in his own right, you know, like a huge pop star who had uh, turned himself into a great blues player by playing with uh, Eric Clapton and playing the Crossroads festivals and stuff. And John Mayer turned his attention to Grateful Dead music. And so they formed a band with him. And John is like an amazing guitarist. And I've spoken to him. That started in 2015. I've interviewed Mayer on my radio show several times and also on uh, online for Nugsnet. So I've had this ongoing conversation with John Mayer over the course of his involvement with this music and listening to him describing his infatuation with it and his coming to you know, to appreciate, understand, and play this music and his evolution as a player of this music over the course of the years has been really, really, really interesting and enjoyable to watch. That band did their final tour last summer, but did not say they were finished playing altogether. And they are now preparing for a run at the Sphere, that amazing new multimedia venue in Las Vegas. They just announced that they're going to be doing a two-month residency at the Sphere, playing three-day weekends, starting in mid-May and going into July. So Dead & Company is not defunct. They're just not playing tours anymore, but they will get together for special occasions. So everybody in, so, in Grateful Dead is still playing music, and everybody, they play together in various configurations. And, and, uh, and as I say, Phil's turning 84 and is not slowing down, apparently. And that Las Vegas thing will include the original four and John Mayer? John Mayer, Jeff Comente, and um, Jay Lane. Actually, Kreutzmann, I don't think, is going to be playing in this. He had some health issues and dropped out last year, and Jay Lane from Bobby's band became the other drummer. So it's John Mayer, Bob Weir, Mickey Hart, Jay Lane, Jeff Comente, and Oteil Burbridge, the amazing bass player from from back east who was part of the Allman Brothers for many years. Oh, he started oh, yeah. playing with Billy a few years ago and he's been the bass player in Dead and Company. I love him. He's just a wonderful, lovely guy. I've interviewed him many times. He just made a record for a, a, a label in Iceland called Floki Records. He went to Iceland and recorded a record called The Lovely View of Heaven, which is all Hunter Garcia ballads. So O'Teal is deeply into this music and still playing it. <clears throat> and also plays gigs as O'Teal and Friends that covers a lot of dead stuff. That's fascinating. I, I'm just thinking about that Las Vegas gig. Do you think Phil Lesh will show up and play any of those shows in Las Vegas? I, I don't think so. They don't seem to be playing together much, but I, I, I can't say. I haven't spoken to Phil in 25 years. Are you going to go to the Sphere? Uh. I might go if I have a professional engagement there, but it's a little bit out of my price range as an old hippie. Yeah, I was thinking about it till I saw the cost. It is a bit expensive. That seems a little strange for them, but I guess, I mean, it's a I guess that's world, the Las man. Vegas is thing. It business, it, well, I don't know. It, it You know, the, Jerry did his best to keep prices down, but the world has changed tremendously since Jerry died. And the whole music business is very, very, very different. My job does not require me to have an opinion about ticket prices. And so I keep my mouth shut about all that stuff. I, I'm, I'm glad they're playing music. And I'm glad I'm still in a position to work with that music and play it on the radio and support them and play my own versions of Grateful Dead music in my own life. So I, I, I don't have to have an opinion about ticket prices. I'm just glad that they're still playing. Well, they've never played, I mean, they've never recorded a studio album, right? So pretty much everything they've done has just been live performance. Dead and Company? Dead yeah, and Company. they did not record yeah. in the studio. But their live shows have been available. There's an outfit called Nugs.net that has done live streaming, also started by a deadhead named uh, Brad Serling. And they've been doing live streaming. And, and so the whole tour for the last several years has been live streamed into other people's homes from the concerts. And in fact, I got hired by Nugs. Lambert and I got hired by Nugs three three tours ago to do interviews between sets. They were used to put up a card between sets that said, please stay tuned. And they, they thought they'd put some interviews in there. So they hired Gary and me to do interviews with people, uh, various people related to the enterprise and otherwise. And so every 
uh, uh, show between tours, we'd watch the first set and then we would turn in, introduce these interviews, most of which were pre-recorded by the end. But we talked to all the band members and lots of other people related. We talked to the president of the record company. We talked to the mastering engineers. We've talked to all kinds of different people involved in, in that world. And so that, that's been part of it. And so all those shows are available for streaming after the fact, and you can buy the audio downloads of them as well. So there's no studio records of Dead & Company, but there's a huge amount of live material available on the market. And Nugs.net is still streaming uh, a lot of live performances, I guess mostly jam bands, right? Yeah, I'm in there too. I play I play a live show every day since the pandemic started, and I put up one of my live concerts on Nugsnet in their streaming service every month. So Nugsnet offered a started a streaming service a couple months ago where you can subscribe kind of like Spotify, where you can subscribe to their whole library. They've got the Dead and Company and they have older Grateful Dead stuff. They have Bruce Springsteen and Wilco and and uh, Pearl Jam and lots of wow. other and lots of low level artists like me in there. So you can subscribe to the Nugsnet streaming service and listen to some vintage Springsteen and some recent Dead and Company or whatever. That's a very cool service. And I'll tell you, as a working musician, Nugsnet pays their musicians a shitload better than um, uh, Spotify does. Oh, that's great. Yeah, the streaming so, services I, are pretty uh, cheap on their, <laughs> their payments to uh, musicians. They are, it's true. So we're kind of winding down. I want to make sure you've plugged everything that you might want to plug you mentioned that you're on Nugsnet, but you're also on youtube and yeah i play a live show every day I, I have to take days off occasionally like i'm playing an actual live show out of the house on friday but today at four o'clock tomorrow four o'clock most days at four o'clock california time i have a youtube channel i it's user slash dgans i play on it's also on twitter uh and it's also on facebook and it's also on a platform called streamstock.tv and because of the pandemic, I finally got off my lazy ass and opened an online store. So I have books and music for sale there. All of my books, uh, I have three books in print. Uh, my latest one is called Improvised Lives. It's photos and stories from my time hanging with the Grateful Dead. And there's a lot of photos from unusual settings, including members of the band at home and stuff like that, plus the stories of how I got them. And my uh, most recent oral history, This Is All a Dream We Dreamed, and an older book called Conversations with the Dead, which is all interviews with Grateful Dead members. Those and my own CDs are available at perfectible.net. I think that's a great name. Thank you. Well, it, it came out of a recording session when I was making my first album with my buddy Eric Rollins. At the end of a take, we would say, do we need to do it again? We'd say, no, that one's perfectible, which meant we could go back and fix a few things and do overdubs and all. So by the end of the project, I thought, well, let's name the label Perfectible Recordings because it kind of it's a philosophical thing. I, I feel like music, the Grateful Dead taught me that music can't and shouldn't necessarily have to be perfect, but it can be perfect and that's fine. So Perfectible is kind of like, yeah, you can play it perfectly, but it's okay if it isn't perfect also. So you don't fix it in the mix, yeah, then, let it out. <laughs> No, well, we do. I mean, you, you when you're recording, you can go back and fix things, but you don't squash the life out of it. You can fix a wrong note by singing it again, or you can use some technology to correct the note here and there. But the point of, of recording is not to make a perfect recording. It's to make a recording that perfectly captures the spirit of what you're doing. So we use the tools to improve the recordings, but not to squash the life out of them. What do you feel about the remastered think, versions of certain classic recordings? Some I've heard were great, and some I've heard were just like, you know, why did he bother? <laughs> well, they bother because they want to they want to sell those records to us again, and that's a totally understandable impulse. Some of them are great, and some of them are are, are unnecessary, you know. But <laughs> every few years, the technology increases improves. And the skill of the mastering engineers improves. And these days, there's even um, AI tools that are available. You can even remix old stereo recordings. Like there's somewhere Jerry's guitar was a little too weak in there. So they can apply this AI technology to bring some of that out and correct deficiencies in mixes of stuff that was previously unremixable. 
So that I'm in favor of it as long as it's all optional, right? as long as you can still have the old version of it if you want it. But I think remastering has indeed brought out aspects of old records that that were missing from the originally mastered versions. So a record that's mastered today, the, the tools available to improve the sound are tremendously greater than they were 30, 40 years ago when those records first came out. So there's a, it's valuable um, if you, you know, if, if you want to listen that closely and if you have like a super high end stereo system, you can appreciate the improvements. And also there's now high res mixes, you know, there's these labels that put out 9624 and even uh, uh, Warner Brothers now puts out 192K super high res uh, recordings that you can listen to on your super high res stereo systems and stuff. So if as long as people are buying and also vinyl, you know, things are coming out on vinyl now, uh, which is, you know, a lot of fun and a lot of people appreciate vinyl and all. So I've got no problem with people trying to make another dollar off their recordings if they can, because it's really, really, really hard to sell recorded music in the age of Spotify. So again, my job doesn't require me to have an opinion about the morality of it. I will tell you how I feel about the acoustics of it, the audio quality. But beyond that, it's it's what everybody can do. We're just all just trying to make a living in an incredibly difficult uh, trade. So we have reached the end of the hour. I feel like we could probably talk forever, but thanks so much, David, for joining us. This has been a great conversation. I really enjoy talking with you guys, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, speak to your audience. And thank you for your time. Right you again. rejoin thank us so down much. the road sometime. John knows where to find me, and I thank you again. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Thanks so much. David. Take care, everybody. Bye -bye. Bye. See you. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.